So now we move on and, and I just want to notify everybody just um, so I'm not the only one keeping an eye on it. At 10 o'clock, we do have a public hearing we need to, uh, to do. So um, just to keep an eye on that. We have Governor's Proclamation Genocide Awareness Month. Um, this month is Genocide Awareness Month um, as decreed by the governor. And we have William Corbett here, I believe, to, to um, talk a little bit about genocide and um, his experience there. We do, and I, if I may, Drew, I'm just gonna take a moment to introduce um, Mr. Corbett into our meeting. You okay with that? Aloha, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Corbett. Thank you very much for the uh, time to spend with you today. Uh, thanks for coming. And also, I wanna say thank you very much, Ms. Lane, for uh, leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I went into a small, low-grade panic when Mr. Klein said, we'll give the honors to whoever the furthest away is uh, coming at you from Honolulu, Hawaii here this morning. Uh, so thank you for sparing <laughs> hey, uh, me being. Bill, let me just interrupt you for one second. I'm gonna do a quick introduction just to kind of set the table before you jump in, if I may. And I have one question for you, um, but we are excited to have, um, you know, William Corbett uh, joining us this morning. Um, and he has, uh, You'll, as you will see shortly, he has quite a depth of experience around this topic, um, but we owe him a special gratitude as he just pointed out, he's coming from us the furthest. For those of you who've traveled a bit, you know that it is not, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning in Hawaii right now. And so he is doing yeoman's duty by even being here. Um, but given that it was the uh, governor's, uh, you know, proclamation around April being uh, Genocide Awareness Month, uh, and keeping with the theme that we had in our last month's meeting of bringing some of these contemporary issues forward and making sure we're having conversation around them, um, we asked uh, William Corbett to share with us this morning. And so, William, just the one quick question I have for you. I've been given some slides that I can share, um, and you just need to let me know when you want me to put those up on the screen, and I will take care of that. Uh, thank you. And otherwise, the floor is yours, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you very much, Commissioner Edelblit, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you this morning or this afternoon, or I guess this morning here. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the governor's proclamation, which was a very fine statement about not only the importance of remembering uh, the Holocaust and genocide, but also uh, contemplating a little bit of not just the situation in the global span of what's happening in different places in the world uh, that are on what we call a genocide watch alert, but also there's some lessons that we can learn in our own communities about uh, what has happened in some of these terrible places. The, my entry into this was almost accidental. I'll, I'll share with you a, a very brief uh, story. When I was assigned uh, uh, as the FBI attache to our embassy in, in Nairobi, Kenya, I got a call one afternoon from the US Marshals asking me if I would assist them with an extradition. There was a, a person being extradited from the United States to Tanzania. So I had to drive to Tanzania to, to render this person from the plane and, and deliver them to the prison. Pretty straightforward task. And the only thing that I caught my attention on the cable was the, uh, the, the individual's defense attorney was Ramsey Clark, the former United States Attorney General, which I thought was interesting. But uh, when I got to the airport and I got on the plane, the, uh, I was surprised to find a geriatric old man uh, sitting kind of rumpled in his seat. And, and in, in my broken high school French, I'd asked him if... Uh, he had all these things and we could go and I had to explain to him that I had to handcuff him. And his only question was if he could bring his Bible with him, at which point I had uh, said, sure, but I'm not, I'm, I don't think they're probably gonna let you keep it at the prison, but nevertheless, off we went. And at the end of that very brief 10 minute acquaintanceship, I, I bid him good luck and made my way back to the uh, embassy the next day rather uneventfully. But it wasn't until the political officer sort of mugged me and asked me what it was like and what the, uh, gentleman was like, and they had a, a bunch of questions for me. And, and Commissioner, if you could maybe just bring up that first slide. This is where I uh, had my introduction to who Elzephus and Takiruti Amana was and what his crimes were. He was essentially the, uh, the head of the Seventh-day Adventist church in, uh, outside of Kigali that uh, the church owned a compound. And in 1994, when the uh, genocide started, uh, uh, his, his parishioners 
had sought uh, his assistance in helping them. They were primarily uh, Tutsis and he was a Hutu. So he had encouraged all of them to uh, uh, make their way to the compound where the church was. And little did they know that they were being lured to their death. And when there was no more room for any of these uh, refugees on the compound, and Takiru Tiamani went to get uh, uh, the Hutu mobs and had circled, uh, they were circling in their trucks, swinging their machetes and chanting to their uh, soon to be victims. And uh, this title of the book that uh, Philip Guvrich wrote was, comes from a letter that was found at the crime scene where one of the uh, murder victims had penned a letter to Intaki Rutimani to say, it's not looking good for us here. We're, we're uh, uh, in a very bad spot, but uh, that person could never have known that uh, the person, uh, Intaki Rutimani was in fact the lead co-conspirator. That's what he was criminally charged for. Uh, and there's a next slide, if you, if, if you see, that's actually the, the uh, uh, International Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda where he was tried. And there's the uh, gentleman up there on the top right. Okay. Well, th thanks for the uh, slides, Commissioner Edelblit, appreciate it. So this, this uh, experience that I had, uh, it, it reminded me of Hannah Arendt's uh, famous aphorism that she gave the world, the banality of evil. This was, of course, her observation of seeing Adolf Eichmann when he was brought to a, a trial in, in uh, Israel, expecting to see perhaps horns and claws and fangs. She saw just a, a, an old man who reminded her a lot of her uncle. And, and to think of the acts and deeds that he had authored in the horror, and yet in his personage, he seemed quite uh, ordinary. And, th and that often is the case in these mass atrocities and uh, uh, genocides and these events, the architects, the authors, and even the perpetrators, they look very much like uh, the rest of us. There's nothing that stands out about them per se. And that can be a very eerie, uh, 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 reality to come to grips with. In my uh, submitted testimony, I use this phrase uh, the, that we, we call uh, an overvalued idea. In my 22 years or so with the FBI, I spent most of it with the counterterrorism division. And I spent about five years with this unit called the Genocide War Crimes Program. But it was really the counterterrorism division that took me to places like Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and Bagram Prism and all sorts of detention facilities across Africa and the Middle East. And I spent countless hours sitting down with mostly young men who had uh, arrived there because of this radicalization that had caused them to see the world through this straw where initially the idea, let's say that in this case, religious fundamentalism or religious extremism, there's a kernel of uh, decency to that, right? There's a virtue in wanting to live a, uh, a straight life and, and but when that starts turning into a piety, and then you start disassociating with other people who don't have that same worldview, and you start perseverating on this set of ideas, and it's the first thing you think of when you wake up in the morning, it's the last thing you think of at the end of the day, and eventually you reach this point uh, uh, where it becomes almost your identity. And you, you can think of the analogy we think about, say, you know, having a fit physique, that's something we should all celebrate and strive for. And maybe some of us might increase our exercise regimes. Some of us might start uh, dieting. Uh, but when we no longer hang around people who aren't in our health club, and this is what we're dedicating our life to, and eventually that, if that path takes us on a sort of slippery slope where we're, now we're fighting with eating disorders, this is the uh, insidious element of, of going too far, if you will. And, that, and that's the nature of this concept of overvalued ideas. Um, in the governor's proclamation, he talks about threats. And normally when we consider threats, we, we refer to those as when intentionality meets uh, capability, these sort of two vectors that when they join and they reach the stage, okay, well, that's something we need to contend with. But the threat here really is the insidious nature of ideas and what happens when ideas creep into uh, our community and they take hold and can have real distorting effects uh, I, I also teach out here at the University of Hawaii. I teach administration of justice. One of the first things I do with my freshman class is we watch a New York Times documentary on what was the most expensive case that the United States has ever had a criminal prosecution. And you may be surprised to uh, hear that it, 
It was actually against uh, the McMartin daycare. If uh, those uh, folks that are my age might remember in the 1980s, there was a rumor of uh, a, a sexual abuse against the children at this institution. And you can imagine when parents hear that, light on facts, heavy on speculation on such an important issue, everybody became so invested that uh, they ended up pursuing this matter where they were literally imagining things that weren't happening. And uh, five years and mul years later, multi-millions of dollars, it turns out really there was no evidence that was ever substantiated or corroborated. It turned, it turned out really that this whole episode was some bad investigating. There was never any, any sexual abuse. But the question is how do we as a community sometimes become so deeply invested into something that, as we say, there's a, a kernel of purpose to it, but that kernel ends up sort of metastasizing and maybe some of you might recognize what we're describing here. This is, this is what uh, South African sociologist uh, Stanley Cohen gave the term a moral panic. Uh, this, was, this is the idea that, uh, if you maybe you think the shorthand of the, of the Salem witch trials, where there's a phenomenon that's going on, it's something worthy of addressing, but when we throw facts out the window, we're just uh, pursuing something for purposes of emotion and intention, and rather than being guided by facts and science and reason, it, it becomes very much a, a slippery slope. I know that the, many of the issues that your board has to contend with is the idea of curriculum. And as we look at what this last contentious year has showed us in terms of mobs and, and uh, overheated passions and sometimes reason being thrown out the window, it seems like this is a, a, a real important thing to consider as we're teaching our next generation uh, what ideas to accept, what ideas to re reject. I know uh, educators have a very important role in that. And so it's my hope that uh, as you all consider this process of deciding what type of curriculum students are gonna have, keep in mind that, that uh, the potential danger of wanting to address something, but over fixating on it to the point where even the remedy could be worse than the actual problem itself. So perhaps I'll put it on pause. I know we're short on time and maybe if there was any questions, I, uh, I'd be happy to address them. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Did anybody have any questions? I, I have a question. Um, thanks, thank you so much. That was great. What you were talking about with the Hutus and that story in Africa, um, there's a movie on Netflix called Black Earth Rising that gets into that exact occurrence in great detail. And it just kind of puts some emotion towards what you were talking about. I have a question when you were talking about light on facts, heavy on speculation, and how that kind of leads to these genocidal events or these really extremist ideas. In your experience, how do you see this age of obsessionism that we kind of have right now where people get latched to ideas, social media is crafted in a way that feeds those ideas via advertisements and cookies and things that just reiterate those ideas. Do you see us moving towards uh, potentially more types of genocidal events or extremist thoughts that lead to types of genocide? Or what do you see that timeline looking like in a modern day? Well, I'll tell you that I, I, in my remarks, my, my submitted remarks, I throw the example of Sarajevo out there as sort of a cautionary tale if you think in 1984, Sarajevo actually was selected to host the Winter Olympics. It was such a uh, thriving and flourishing city. And yet six years later, seven years later, the entire country was uh, uh, blotted with mass graves and atrocities against civilians. And it, it happened that quickly where this uh, sort of uh, set of ideas came in and took over everybody. Maybe Com Commissioner Edelblad, if you could just bring up slide number three. To your point, Mr. Terrell, uh, there's some very important work that's been done by a, an academic at New York University. His name is Jonathan Haidt, and he runs a, a program called uh, the uh, Heterodox Academy. And he has a lot of concern about what you're alluding to. The idea is when you're not really confronted with disconfirmation, but rather you're insulated by only your uh, overheated group's set of ideas. And what happens when you hear that and you're not really challenged, you're not invited to see an alternative perspective, this was a gentleman at that same time in 2000, I had a lot of leads in Africa to help the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda find this fugitive. Uh, his indictment there on the right was uh, that the charges that he was uh, being uh, charged with 
and he was a very wealthy man who was always sort of considered the financier of the of the genocide. In in on in his indictment, it describes the radio station he owned. If you could click to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, what you see there is uh, he ended up. I, I spent 20 years chasing this individual from Africa to Madagascar to a couple countries in Europe. And uh, a year after I retired, he was found in France. Uh, but his crime was owning the radio stations that promulgated the hate and the, uh, the, the extremist views of taking action. Uh, it's called Radio Mil Colline. And uh, he never picked up a, a machete. He never had any blood on his hands, but it was his actions. Maybe one more slide, and I guess that's the last slide we have. It's, it was his actions in setting up the uh, radio stations. And you read the language here, it talks about they used the radio station to inspire people to go into mosques and find where the Hutus were hiding and gave uh, encouragement. And it was uh, uh, stri It was telling the, the, the Hutu po uh, population that this was their obligation. They were required to do it. And that's that, I think that point you're making is when you see yourself on the side of angels, of course, we're virtuous. We're not ever doing anything that's wrong. Then by definition, our adversaries are what Stanley Cohen would call uh, folk demons. Uh, in our mind, they're something, uh, it's a social undesirable, it's a threat, it's something that we should eliminate. And in fact, we're doing it together. So there's purpose in it, it's strengthening our community. And this is the sort of uh, common explanation in, in all of these mob psychology type of mass atrocities that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. All right, anyone else? Okay. Great, thank you very much. I, I, my, my closing comment I would say is if there's one area of concern outside of our communities that we really want to look, I would really encourage everybody to check out a website called Campaign for Uyghurs, Uyghurs spelt with the U. It, it lays out uh, some of the atrocities that our State Department has designated as a genocide and our corporations are still uh, aware of it but they're not prioritizing the human rights component of our relationship with the People's Republic of China. It's a very important issue. It's not gonna be going away. And again, as educators, it's something we wanna keep our eye on. Thanks again for your time, ladies and gentlemen. All right, thank you, Mr. Corbett.